Exploring Tomorrow. And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell. When men start a new project, it starts with a plan. The plan has to be carried out, worked through, the details arranged for. You don't have any trouble until the thing you did not expect turns up. So far, human research has achieved an unmanned satellite in space. The sole purpose of any of these devices, any machine, is to serve human beings. The machine goes first to try things out, but the sole purpose of doing it is so that men can follow, and women, too. But there are problems of purely human nature that sometimes complicate the most scientific of plans. Champagne. Oh, there you are, my dearest. My darling, my love, champagne. Oh, good heavens, Jeff. You think we were getting married all over again. Oh, why not? Let's make this our second wedding day. A celebration to end all celebrations. Besides, it is almost our first anniversary. Happy almost first anniversary, Lieutenant Alice. Oh, no. Now, if this is going to be a late wedding feast, you must call me Mrs. Captain Jeffrey Britton. I demand my rights as a legally wedded wife, even if you do outrank me. (laughs) Don't, don't, don't giggle. It's not proper for an officer in the United States Space Service to giggle. And for goodness sake, don't tell me the champagne bubbles tickle your nose. Oh, they don't. I love the stuff. Pour me another. (laughs) Another? My dear Mrs. Britton, that was the finest half pint of domestic champagne of Available, which is all a mere captain can afford. There is no more. For shame. The finest rocket pilot in the United States, and you can't even afford another bottle? No, not even for a going-away party. Oh, Jeff. It is a going-away party, isn't it? I won't see you for six oh. months. Now, come on, sweetheart. Don't cloud up and rain. It's good duty, and you'll be back soon. Six months isn't forever, you know. Oh, I know. But being stuck up on an artificial satellite for six months without you isn't my idea of fun. Oh, look, sweetheart, you like it up there. It's the oldest and biggest of our manned space stations. It has plenty of room inside and a crew of 400 officers and men. It even rotates on its axis to give you artificial gravity. At least you don't have to worry about space sickness. Oh, Jeff, don't be so serious. It's not the fact that I have to be up there that bothers me. It's just that I'm going to miss you. Ah, I thank you so much for that. I'll miss you, too. But there's nothing we can do about it. How right you are. The space service has no use whatsoever for personal feelings. Except, of course, that they hope you don't get killed. Do you know what? I give up what? I was shown an instruction film. Told all about Space Station One. You know how safe it is. Did you know that every compartment has individual heating and oxygen supply in case of emergency? And did you know that all the walls are filled with a plastic self-sealing compound like a a car tire so that if a small meteor hits it, it won't lose too much air? Sure, it's safe. A thousand miles straight up over Earth and you're as safe as in your bed at home. (gasps) Hooray for safety. Mm. And now, my dear cheapskate husband, will you do me the favor of buying me another bit of champagne? I will have to buy it myself. Oh, darling, darling, this is our last night together for six months. So I suppose I'll have to buy more champagne. (laughs) Hey, waiter! Nurse Jenkins, send in Lieutenant Britton. She'll be right in, Doctor. You wanted to see me, Major James? I certainly do. Being medical officer of Space Station One isn't an easy job under any circumstances. But you have made it ten times as difficult. I didn't mean to cause you any trouble, sir. Well, you certainly have. I just got the laboratory report. The test was positive. It was? Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful? What do you mean, wonderful? Well, I... My dear Lieutenant Britton, has it escaped your flittery female mind that you were in Space Station One in an orbit more than a thousand miles from the surface of Earth? Have you forgotten that? No, sir. Well, if I had Captain Britton up here, I'd personally break his neck, but he's not. He's safe down on Earth while you're the one who's going to have the baby. Major James, neither my husband nor I intended this to happen. Of course not, but it did, nevertheless. Oh. 
I suppose it's not your fault, Lieutenant, but it leaves me in an awkward position. What are we going to do? This is a space satellite, not an obstetrics ward. I have neither the drugs nor the equipment to take care of you. Of course not. You'll have to send me back down to Earth when the next rocket leaves. What? You've been up here two months now, and your baby is due in another seven months. Do you think I would risk sending you down to Earth in a rocket at nine gravities of acceleration? Not at this stage of but, the game, Lieutenant. Well, how, how can I stay here? There's nothing else you can do. I'll... I'll have to contact the hospital at White Sands Rocket Base and have them send up the equipment I need on the regular supply rockets. Whether we like it or not, you'll be staying with us for a while. And we're going to have to take very good care of you. Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. This is Bill Goodwin. You know, someone once said humor is the true democracy. And that's why we Americans can smile when we tell the stories of the legendary heroes who helped to build our country's great institutions and industries. Like Bowleg Bill, hero of the tuna fishing industry. Back in Provincetown, Massachusetts, they claimed that when it came to hauling in the horse mackerel, as the eastern is called tuna, Bill could handle two gaffs at once and catch more than any six men put together. And they're still talking about the time Bill caught old Slick Britches, the biggest horse mackerel of them all. No one could ever get his hooks into Slick Britches, who weighed 2,000 pounds and had a tail six feet long. But Bowleg Bill promised to land him single-handed. He set out in his boat, talked up, and when he spotted Slick Britches, he made a grab for him. But the tuna slipped through his hands. So Bill dove over the side, and before folks knew what had happened, Bill was sitting astride old Slick Britches, who was bucking like a bronco. He leaped almost a mile out of the water, but Bill hung on. All over the harbor they went, jumping and leaping, but still Bill hung on. Fight leap over the toss-up, and then calmed down all the fight gone out of him. Bill steered him toward shore, but all of a sudden he headed him back out to sea, slapped the tuna's tail, and jumped off. The folks were mighty disappointed when Slick Britches disappeared, but it was like Bill told them. There's nothing that'll break a cowhand's heart so quick as to find a critter with the rough all rode off at the first mount. Yes, sir, it is a democracy which lets us tell the stories of such a legendary character as Bowleg Bill with a twinkle in our eyes and a chuckle in our throats. And so long as we continue to laugh together as a people, ladies and gentlemen, we will live together as a nation. Alice had called attention to the fact that the space station had not been adequately designed. It had been designed all right to take care of men and of women. But taking care of human individuals is not enough if we are to really enter the space stage. We have to take care of the human race. That's something Alice was bringing to attention. Here's some more of the laboratory reports on Lieutenant Alice Britton, Doctor. Oh, yes, from her last checkup. How is she doing this? Seems to be doing quite well, Doctor. The light gravity is helping, I think. Oh, only 59 days to go. Less than two months, if our figuring is correct. I have nearly all the equipment I need now, and by the time she's ready, it'll all be here. I've been checking it off the list as the supply rockets unload each piece. You don't have far to go. You know, nurse, uh, five months ago when I found out that Lieutenant Britton was going to have a baby, I was really worried. But now it looks as though there's going to be nothing to it. One of the doctors from White Sands Rocket Base is coming up next month to help, and everything ought to go pretty smoothly. I was sure worried for a while. Why were you worried, Doctor? After all, women aren't supposed to go around having babies in space stations. <laughs> well, it looks as though Lieutenant Britton's going to set a precedent. <laughs> Good heavens, I hope not. If all the women in the space service get that idea, we'll be running a nursery up here, not a fueling station. Well, you'll just have to. Oh, emergency signal. There's been an accident. Phone, Doctor. Yeah, I'll get it. Sick ward, Major James speaking. What? Have you got her out of there? Well, then put her on the stretcher and get her to Ward 3. I'll be right down. What happened, Doctor? A small meteorite hit Section 6. And Lieutenant Britton was in there when it happened. They're bringing her up now, but there's no way of knowing how badly she's hurt. Uh, be careful. Easy now. Oh. Now put the stretcher down on the bed. Oh. Easy. Oh. That's it, yeah. Now just take it easy, oh. Lieutenant. All right, men. Uh, she'll be all right now. Thanks. Close the door, huh, please? Oh. Oh. 
I hurt all over. Uh, you'll be okay. Nurse Jenkins will bring down a high phone in a few minutes. You'll be all right. Well, I think I'll live, Major. But my ears are still ringing. Well, you must have lost air. Can you tell me what happened? Uh, I was in Section 6 checking some meters. All of a sudden, bam! A little meteor punctured the outer wall. Just, just a little bit of rock the size of a marble. But it was moving fast enough to put a hole in the wall. It sure was. Then what? When I wasn't hit, the air started going out into the vacuum of space. The wall is self-sealing, but a, a lot of air left the room before the hole closed. The automatic door closed. My ears were ringing. Everything got fuzzy. I guess I fainted. Well, you're lucky the meteor was small and moving fairly slowly. Ceiling compound in the wall closed the hole before you lost too much air, really. Uh, your nose isn't bleeding. You haven't got the bends, at least. No, but I'm afraid the baby's going to be here sooner than we expected. Yes, it looks like it. Now, don't worry. Seven-month babies are just as good as nine-month ones. And you're a pretty healthy girl. You'll be all right. And so will the baby. I know we will. Take care of us, will you, Major? Sure. Don't worry. That's what I'm here for. Remember... How is she, nurse? Gave her a hypo. She'll be able to relax a little. She's lucky to be alive. No, it's not all luck. Everything worked automatically. That's what saved her. Oh, she's all right now. You want me to prepare the room next to hers as a delivery room? We'll need it soon. Well, that's what I was afraid of. But how soon, do you think? Mm, not more than an hour or two, I'd say. What's the matter, doctor? You look worried. Your premature baby has to have a specialized environment. An incubator. If it doesn't, its chances of survival are small, right? Oh, well, yes. Well, sir. we haven't got an incubator. The nearest one is more than 1,000 miles away, straight down. The plans that had been made, again, were not sufficient. You know, many times, a man who is working with machines and knows the machine in full, understands what it does and its functions has never recognized what its basic nature is. Uh, it's he too close to it. It's the forest and the trees again. And sometimes somebody who really doesn't know as much about the machine understands it better. Major James speaking. Yes, Colonel. From where? Europe. Yes, sir. Yes, I understand, sir. Very well, Colonel. Thank you. Oh, Brother, that does it. What's the matter now, sir? Our message to White Sands was intercepted. The newscasters have gotten hold of the story. The communications officer just picked up a broadcast from Europe. Big stuff. First baby born in space. Emergency measures being taken. The whole world knows about it now, and everybody on Earth is praying for Lieutenant Britton and her baby. Big sob story. Well, Doctor, you may not like all the publicity, and maybe it isn't a good thing in some ways, but personally, I'm kind of glad it happened. Oh? But why? Doctor, that girl may need all that praying. Well, we better get things ready, nurse. How long do we have? Half an hour at the outside. I had Nurse Bryson fix up the preliminaries. Any news? Well, the station commander called. He said that White Sands has assigned Captain Britton to pilot the rocket that's bringing up the incubator. She'll be glad to see him. She's supposed to have gone back to where some months ago. Yeah, it'll probably do her good to see him. How's she feeling now? Oh, pretty fair. I think she'll be all right. She's got a lot of nerve, that one. She'll need every bit of nerve if she loses that baby. I know, I know. You don't need to remind me. We need an incubator within half an hour, and there won't be one here for two hours. We haven't got it, and that's that. What can I do? I've tried everything. Can't the construction crew build one? Well, I thought of that first thing. I called the construction officer. He told me that there isn't any spare material up here to build one out of. It costs plenty to ship stuff up here by rocket, so they only order what they absolutely need. Isn't there anything at all? Well, not unless they cut holes in the space station. And that's what they're doing. They're ripping out one of the partitions. They'll use a heater from a wall and the oxygen apparatus from a spacesuit. 
They're trying to get it finished in time. But they won't finish in time, is that it? That's it. They'll get done about 15 minutes before the rocket gets here. There's just no time, that's all. <laughs> now, try to take it easy, Lieutenant. Don't rush things. Well, I'm not rushing anything. Well, now, don't worry about anything. You'll be all right. I know. But I wish Jess was here. Your husband is on his way, Lieutenant. He's taking a special rocket up from White Sands. How long will it be? You'll have to hurry. He'll be a little late, I'm afraid. We have the delivery room already. It won't be long now. I know it won't. Did you get all the stuff you needed? How, how about the incubator? Well? There. There isn't any incubator. I didn't take the possibility of a premature delivery into our account. It's all my fault. But I've done what I could. Your husband is bringing an incubator up in the rocket. It won't be too long. I think we'll be able to keep the child in good health until he gets here. Look to... Look to Britain. Alice, this is no time to get hysterical. Stop it. I'm not hysterical, Doctor. You are. Look at you. You're so nervous... You can't even think straight. Well, well, well what, what, what do you mean? Well, what, what? Figure it out for yourself. Take a look around you and ask yourself, why is a space station like an incubator? Good heavens, of course, that's it. Can I come in? Yes. We finally made it. Come over here. Oh, hey, you look fine. How does it feel to be the most famous mother on <laughs> earth? Huh? Or off it? Oh, I don't care about being famous. It's wonderful just to be a mother. And how do you feel, Daddy Britton? Oh, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Say, I, I brought you an incubator, but but um, Major James said uh, you won't need it. I asked him why, and he said he felt too too foolish about it to explain. He said I should ask you. What's the story? <laughs> well, it was very funny. Poor man was running around in circles worrying about an incubator. He had you bring one up, and I understand he had the construction crew tearing down the walls to make one. Really? Really. And I finally asked him, why is a space station like an incubator? And he got it right away. Got it? Got what? Oh, don't you see, silly? A space station is a sort of an incubator. It protects us poor, weak humans from the airlessness and extremities of temperature in space. And each room of this station is a separate compartment. They can be self-sustaining if they have to. So what did the Major do? He just had one whole room isolated. He raised the temperature, pumped in extra oxygen, and bingo, he had an incubator. Well... Where is my son? I want to see him. Your daughter, dear, and she's in the next room. Huh? Oh, but you can't go right in. You just wait. You've got a good many years ahead of you to get acquainted with her. All right. I guess I just have to practice getting acquainted with you. <laughs> Come here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the impression that science fiction has to do with machines. It's all about gadgets and ray guns. It isn't. That's why it's science fiction. It has to do with human beings and the problems that human beings will have with the machines we do and must live with. And if the machines aren't properly designed to recognize that their purpose is to serve humanity, they're no good either. Heard in our cast tonight were Lawson Zerby, Carol Titel, and script was by Randell Garrett. Produced and directed by Sanford Martin in New York. Guy Wallace speaking. This is the world's largest network.